so it may be kind of brief, but very, very important uh, lecture today with an important set of definitions. Um, so if let's say we're in our just just for the moment to make it easy for me to draw pictures on the board. And we've got a two by two matrix, and we've got some vector. This two by two matrix defines a transformation from R2 to itself, which is just an extremely formal way of observing that we can take a vector in R2 and we can multiply it by A and we get, I guess I wrote that twice, but we can take a vector in R2 and multiply it by A and get a new vector in R2. And in general, this new vector in R2 is going to have a different length and it's going to have a different direction from the original vector. It might happen sometimes, however, that you're in R2 and you've got this vector and you multiply this vector by this matrix A and the direction of the vector doesn't change or possibly the direction of the vector literally flips around, but the line of the vectors on doesn't change. That's an extremely important thing when it happens. Um, and if that does happen, if multiplying this vector by this matrix changes the length of the vector, well, we can change lengths of vectors by a scalar multiplication. So if we've got some matrix A, the situation we're describing is that A times a vector is the same as a scalar times a vector. A times V equals lambda times V. Um, where again, lambda is a scalar. So if this ever happens, and it's going to turn out that it always happens for some lambda and some V, then lambda is called an eigenvalue of A. Lots of important German mathematicians. And this vector V is an eigenvector of A associated with this particular number lambda. So the way that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are defined is that they're defined in pairs. You know, you have this um, sort of equality and we're simultaneously <laughs> defining an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. That's a little... What's the word I'm looking for? 
that doesn't quite reflect how we'll use eigenvalues and eigenvectors in practice, which is that we'll find the eigenvalues first and then use the eigenvalues to find the eigenvectors, or at least that's what we'll do in the classroom. So, for example, say that A is three, negative two, one, zero. Then lambda, this, the Greek letter lambda, if you haven't seen it before, it's the standard notation for eigenvalues. Lambda equals two. Is an eigenvalue. And I'm going to demonstrate this right from the definition. Uh, come on, Zoom. Why you gotta be like this? So the definition says that for this to be an eigenvalue, there should be some V such that A times V equals two times V. And as I, I said, I was going to do this right from the definition, as I'm looking at this, I'm realizing this is actually quite a difficult um, problem to solve the way it's set up, because there are unknowns on both the left and the right-hand side. If the right-hand side were a known vector, we could just use Gauss-Jordan elimination, but it isn't. So I'm going to do this problem. I'm not giving up. We'll just, we'll see how we, let me get our calculator running. We'll see how we can use this definition to find V. And I mean, the naive thing to do would be something like this. I've already said that that V on the right is what's causing trouble. So what if what if we brought everything over to the right? Then I call it this naive verbally. Yeah. Let me just put that very clearly for the record. Um, if we did this, we could pull that V out and then we'd have something times a vector equals zero. And we'd think we could use Gauss-Jordan elimination. And I mean, the problem is, is going to become instantly obvious when you when you ask yourself okay so what's a times two a is a matrix two is a number a minus two sorry minus a minus two is not defined so we can't do this exactly but we're on the right track. A V equals two V. A times V is a vector, two times V is a vector. We're saying that a vector equals a vector, nothing wrong. 
a times v minus two times v. No problem here. A times v is a vector, two times v is a vector. We're subtracting two vectors. Everything is above board. The problem came when we pulled that i out. And the, the trick here, the reason we're having this problem is that the V on the left is being multiplied by a matrix and the V on the right is being multiplied by a number. So when we pull the V out, we get a matrix minus a number. So the way around this is to say, well, the identity matrix is like one. The identity matrix times any vector is still that vector. So we have this A V minus two times the identity matrix times V equals zero. And now when we pull V out, we get a legitimate statement. Two times the identity matrix is a matrix. So we have a matrix minus a matrix. That's defined. It's a matrix times a vector equals the zero vector. And we can solve this using Gauss-Jordan elimination. We take A minus 2i, and we augment it with the zero vector, and we hit this with Gauss-Jordan elimination. So by the time we're done with this course, we'll be doing subtraction like this in your head, almost certainly, but for the moment, let's write this down. A is three, negative two, one, zero. So two I is two times the identity matrix. And the identity matrix has zeros down the diagonal, ones everywhere else. So it's two, zero, zero, two. A minus two I then is one, negative two, one, negative two. And when we create the augmented matrix, I loaded my calculator up, but this is a, a two seconds in your head kind of thing. You multiply the first row by negative one, you add it to the second row. And, huh, this is interesting. You find that in fact, there are a bunch of eigenvectors vectors associated with this eigenvalue. Um, if we call our coefficients v1 and v2, or the entries of the vector, I should say, then, um, then v2 is a free variable because there's only that one pivot in the first row. And we find 
V1 minus 2V2 equals 0. V1 equals 2V2. And remember, when this didn't go great on the first test, I said, you know, please learn to, to solve these because this is just going to keep going up for coming up forever. You see, it's it's coming up here. We buffer in V2 equals V2. And we get this is always a kind of weird looking statement, I, I think, but we get that V equals two times one times V sub two. I, I just always think it's a little weird looking because V sub two is part of V. So it looks kind of circular, like you're defining V in terms of itself. But in fact, V sub two is just a free variable. It can be any real number. Or almost any real number. Or any real number but one. That has triggered a memory of something that I should have written down here but didn't. Exception. V equals zero is never an eigenvector. And it's never an eigenvector because it would, if it were allowed to be an eigenvector, every single real number would always be an eigenvalue. Um, any matrix times the zero vector equals um, any real number times the zero vector. It doesn't matter what the real number is. So in order to avoid this situation where every number is an eigenvalue, we have to put this requirement on V. So almost any real number. If B2 were zero, then we would get zero as an eigenvector, and that is not the left. So this I mean, I, I said that we would find the eigenvectors. We did that. When we did that, we found that at least in this case, there were infinitely many eigenvectors. Let me put that on the board as a theorem. Every eigenvalue of any matrix has infinitely many eigenvectors. So we don't know about eigenvalues. 
So we don't know, maybe matrices have zero eigenvalues or finitely many or infinitely many. We'll answer that question when we have a few more tools in our belt. But if there's an eigenvalue, there's definitely infinitely many eigenvectors. Let me state a few theorems. This is a very important section, but a bit scattershot because it's trying to lay all of the groundwork for future stuff. If lambda one and lambda two are different eigenvalues of A, and V1 is an eigenvector of lambda one and V two is an eigenvector of lambda two, then the set V one comma V two is linearly independent. So different eigenvalues give linearly independent eigenvectors. And there's no possibility, for example, that two different eigenvalues will have the same eigenvector. Um, of this look like. If I can come up with a proof in one minute, I'll give the proof. Otherwise, we'll just accept this. I'll say there, say they are dependent. So A1, V1, plus A2, V2 equals zero, then nah, I'm not seeing it. But it, I mean, it's true. I'm just not off the top of my head seeing what the proof would look like. So we'll move on. Um, theorem. So now let's say we have one eigenvalue. Well, we'll still call it lambda sub one, even though there is only this one. And let's say that this eigenvalue as V1 and V2 as its eigenvectors, then C1, V1 plus C2, V2 is also an eigenvector. So with this theorem, you um you can sort of see why 
there, there are infinitely many eigenvectors because once you have one eigenvector, all of the constant multiples of that eigenvector are also eigenvectors. And if you happen to have two linearly independent eigenvectors, you can use this to create even more eigenvectors. Um, so, definition. The set of all eigenvectors associated with an eigenvalue bus the zero vector is called the eigenspace of the eigenvalue. And now that we've We've spent all of chapter four talking about vector spaces. If we're going to give something a name like the eigenspace, that had better be a vector space. And it is. Um, it's a vector space, well, because it's in Rn, meaning that to be a subspace of Rn, only two things need to happen. It needs to be closed under addition and scaled or multiplication, which it is via this theorem. And the zero vector needs to be there, which it is because we're explicitly taking the zero vector and putting it in there. And again, we had to add zero separately as its own special thing because zero isn't an eigenvector. A few more stray theorems. Theorem. If Zero is an eigenvalue of a matrix. That matrix is not invertible. Uh, the fancy way of saying this is that the matrix is singular. Um, the proof of this theorem is like a sentence using the invertible matrix theorem. If zero is an eigenvalue, There's some X, which is not the zero vector, because the zero vector cannot be an eigenvector. Then A times some non zero vector equals zero. And if you, the invertible matrix theorem is like. 12 lines long. If you go through it, you'll find that one of the things that's equivalent to a matrix not, to a matrix being invertible, 
is that AX equals zero only has the trivial solution. So by, by logic, um, if that's equivalent to A being invertible, then having non-trivial solutions is equivalent to A not being invertible. As a matter of fact, this is, uh, let's see, this is an if and only if statement. Um, but but this is the, the part of the theorem that we're more likely to need. Keep going with the theorems. Finding eigenvalues is extremely non-trivial. We'll talk about that later, but in general, if you want to find an eigenvalue, you're going to be using some kind of computer algorithm, and the computer algorithm isn't going to try to find the eigenvalues exactly. It's going to be some sort of numerical estimation algorithm. The exception to the statement that finding eigenvalues is uh, not easy to do is the following. If A is triangular, remember what triangular means, either all of the entries above the main diagonal in the matrix are zero, or all the entries below the main diagonal are zero. If A is triangular, its eigenvalues are its diagonal elements. So, for example, one, two, four, seven, zero, zero, three, two, zero, zero, thank you, one, four, zero, 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 three. Yeah. This is a triangular matrix. Don't get, don't get fooled by that color, color. Don't get fooled by that zero on the diagonal. The definition of a triangular matrix is that everything above or below the main diagonal is zero and here, everything below the main diagonal is zero. So this is triangular. And the eigenvalues are one, zero, one again, and three. Uh, I guess the most natural thing to do would to not be to list one twice, but actually it, it can be useful to, to have this one twice. I mean, looking ahead a bit, just like a, just like a root of a polynomial ha can have a multiplicity, an eigenvalue has a multiplicity, and having that one listed twice is telling us something. Incidentally, and combining this with the previous theorem, this matrix must not be invertible because one is an eigenvalue. Um, this, this theorem is super important. It, it's not going to be 
really that important in this class, but I said a few minutes earlier that when we want to find eigenvalues, we're normally using some kind of algorithm. And one of the major numerical algorithms that we use to find eigenvalues is one that takes a matrix and it applies, it does stuff to the matrix that makes it closer and closer to being a triangular matrix without changing the eigenvalues. And then as it gets closer and closer to being triangular, the numbers on the diagonal become closer and closer to being the eigenvalues. So this is the foundation of a major eigenvalue finding algorithm. Let me see. The following, we've it, it's isolated as a theorem in the textbook. We already used this when we found the eigenvectors of two. Um, a few frames back. But theorem, maybe it's not so much a theorem. As an alternate definition, but if there is a lambda and a V that is not the zero vector such that A minus lambda I times V equals the zero vector, then lambda is an eigenvalue. V is called an eigenvector. So sometimes some textbooks will just use this as the definition. Um, because in in practice, this is this is what we're going to be using most of the time. Like when we try when we had an eigenvalue and we wanted an eigenvector, what did we do? We rewrote this equation as A minus the eigenvalue times I times the unknown vector V equals zero. So this is, whether you want to think of it as a theorem or an alternative definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it's what we'll be primarily using. Um, the reason we don't state it first is that it's, it's obscuring what this definition actually means. It's not obvious to look at this equation and say, oh, well, multiplying A by V does not change the direction of V, but rather scales it by the constant lambda. So first we give the definition that makes it clear what's happening, but then we move on and use this alternate definition in most practical situations. Well, it's very early. I mean, I knew it would be, but with the test on Thursday, I thought cover one section this week, however long that takes. 
So yeah, uh, I'll see you Thursday. Uh, that's pretty.